The last part to look at is time slicing. So for time slicing, again, a way of ensuring isolation, we want to make sure that a processes can share a CPU. One way to do that is cooperatively. So we have process A, and it will have some code. where it'll do stuff, and then it'll call yield. So let's say that's in a loop where it's doing stuff and then calling yield. And process B, again, has this loop where it is doing other stuff and then calling yield. So the key is when we call yield, what we're saying is, I am willing to give up the CPU at this point. Okay? If I'm the only process running, then yield is gonna basically be a no alt. It's gonna be a quick check to see that nothing else is running. Yield presumably goes into the kernel. Like that's how this is gonna have to work. So yield is gonna go into the kernel, the kernel's gonna look and say, there's no other processes running, return back to A. So process A, make from its point of view, it makes a call to yield and it returns. However, if process B is also running, then when the call to yield happens, it's going to go into the kernel, and then the kernel is going to go back into process B. Where in process B? Well, where process B last left off, which is it is called a yield. So we're going to have this ping-ponging back and forth where returning from yield here, sorry, calling yield here, returns from yield here. And then when we come back and call yield here, that'll cause a return here. This is called coroutines. And in many languages, you can actually just set those up in user mode. So you can have one process within it, instead of having two functions, one of which is subordinate to another as a subroutine, you can have coroutines that call back and forth. Uh, generators in, in Python are an example of that, where you will uh, yield elements uh, in, in an iterative, iterative value, iterative process. So the good news about this is that any process knows exactly when it's going to be lo losing the CPU. Okay, so that is uh, is handy. Um, and what does yield actually have to do? What's, what's it going to do? Well, it has to context switch. What does context switch mean? We're going to switch. We're going to switch to the page table. All right, and that's how we get our isolation of address spaces. And what else are we going to switch? We're going to switch. Really, all we need to switch are the registers. Because if you think about it, the state of a process is the state of its memory plus the state of any information in the kernel kept on its behalf. Plus what else? I mean, as it's, as it's running, everything's either in memory or in the kernel's memory or it's in the registers. So all we need to do is really switch the registers and the page table, and that gives us a context switch. That's enough to start executing another program. Okay. Our registers are going to get us back to the code where we were. That is, back to uh, executing here. The stack is going to be taking us to the right place. All the other registers will, be, will, will restore to the values that they had. So that's basically what yield is going to be doing. And if you were trying to implement uh, cooperative threads in a single process, it'd be the same thing, except you'd be sharing the same page table. So you would not switch out the page table. Instead, you would just switch registers. And there are libraries to do that, and that's how Python works, uh, for instance, for with its generators, coroutines. Uh, the problem is, of course, that process A could fail to call yield. 
for an unbounded amount of time. And that's a definite issue. Um, the, even in a preemptive multitasking case, there are calls you can make to give up the processor. For instance, you can call sleep and say, I'd like to sleep for 10 seconds. So what that does basically then is calls the kernel. The kernel says, okay, we're not gonna run your process for 10 seconds. We'll run this other stuff. And when we're done with, with those 10 seconds, then we'll come back to you. All right, instead of cooperative, let's look at preemptive. So in the preemptive case, we've got process A calling, doing its stuff, process B doing its other stuff, and we still wanna share time. So how can that work? Well, one possibility, right? Process A might, as part of its doing stuff, making a, make a system call. When it makes a system call, that's certainly an opportune time for the kernel to say, oh, maybe now I should go ahead and context switch into process B. But if you've got a process that's not making any system calls, then the kernel doesn't really have an opportunity to take control, to wrest control back from proc A and execute proc B. Because the, the kernel is not magic, right? If the kernel lets process A start running and process A then just does user instructions, it's calculating pi, you know, to a million decimal places, then there's no easy way for the kernel to get back control. Unless the kernel, before it starts process A, executing, puts a leash on it. So here's what the kernel can do. Before starting uh, execution of a process, Right. That is really before context switching to the process, set a timer. Okay. So what that means is the kernel sets a timer, let's say for, I don't know how much, so a second would probably be way too big. Let's give it uh, a millisecond. So we're gonna set a timer for a millisecond and call under procedure A. There's two possibilities of what happened in that case. Procedure A either calls a system call before that 10 milliseconds is up. Did I say 10 or well, let's assume I said 10, okay? So it said timer for 10 milliseconds and then the procedure A calls a system call before that 10 milliseconds is up. In that case, the kernel could then decide to stop process A running and run process B by doing a context switch. However, if the 10 milliseconds elapses, we're still running process A user instructions. All of a sudden the timer goes off. What happens when a timer goes off? We get an interrupt. Who gets control when an interrupt happens? The kernel gets control. The kernel can then go look and say, oh wait, I got a timer interrupt. I had set A running. A has exceeded its quantum, that is the amount of time I gave it to run. Therefore, I will context switch to another process. Before I context switch into the process though, what did I better do? I better set a timer to ensure that process doesn't exceed the amount of time I'm willing to give it. And I can, I don't have to have a fixed quantum for every single process. I could adjust this based on the process, based on other things that are happening. If I have a lot of process ready to run, I might reduce the quantum. If this seems to be the only process to run, I might increase it. The, the problem with having smaller and smaller quantum is that where the overhead of going into the kernel and coming out would be extreme. So that is the, that demystifies the magic by which the kernel gets access again when a user program is running. It gets access because either the user program has made a system call, which by definition means the kernel gets control, or because the kernel had preset a timer to ensure that if the process took too long, again, the kernel would regain control.